Yeah, so I get to talk about this a lot. So this is kind of a slightly different audience. I think the most, the last several times I've talked about this project, it's often been to kind of ag audiences or policymakers. So I tried to bring in some more of the kind of science to this so you can see more of what we've been working on and kind of where we're heading with it. Um, but yeah, since about probably 2011, I think, we had a um, NSF-funded coupled natural and human systems proposal, and that's what really started this work. And it was just kind of um, fortunate timing because 2011 was the first kind of big bloom that started getting people's attention in Lake Erie, and that just happened to be the year we started this project. We happened to pick um, Western Lake Erie as our kind of case study, kind of geographic location for the questions we were interested in, and so we've been working on this issue for a while, which has led to a lot of new opportunities um, here, like Jason was mentioning, the last couple years as well. Um, so I'll kind of walk through what the motivation of that original project was and where kind of my piece fit into that, highlight some of our findings around um, farmer behavior and how that might jive or not jive with what we're lear learning on the physical science side of the equation for this, and then kind of point out um, where we're going next with this research through um, actually a new NSF funded project, <laughs> along with some other um, opportunities working with the fertilizer industry and also with the EPA on some Great Lakes restoration projects. So, um, so I always feel like I have to show the obligatory kind of Lake Erie satellite image, right, of the harmful algal blooms. No, nothing super surprising to all of you. Um, but just highlighting a little bit of the background on this, obviously the harmful algal blooms have been becoming more severe in Lake Erie. Um, the kind of attribution of that has been to dissolved reactive phosphorus. So when you look over time at the phosphorus loading into the lake, we've actually maintained a pretty steady level of total phosphorus, but we've seen a big increase in dissolved reactive phosphorus while at the same time the particulate phosphorus levels have gone down, um, largely a result or at least partially a result of conservation efforts made in agriculture back in the 80s and 90s um, trying to reduce soil erosion. Um, but we've seen this kind of increase in blooms and when we, when we track the kind of different forms of phosphorus over time, we see that the dissolved reactive phosphorus that's in the water column has doubled since 1995. So we've seen this big increase. So people have started to kind of question and try to figure out you know, what's driving that. Um, so far, in terms of the kind of state of the science on the kind of um, uh, water quality side and the physical modeling side as far as the landscape goes, um, we know now that the Maumee River is the really major driver of harmful algal blooms in western Lake Erie. Um, according to this OEPA mass balance study, about 87% of the phosphorus is coming from non-point sources. Um, agriculture being the primary land use in the watershed that's driving that. So we don't necessarily say 87% is coming from agriculture, but when you put the two together, the assumption there is that a lot of this is driven by fertilizer use in agriculture. And interestingly, the loading, which a lot of you probably know this given your focus and what you work on, the loading occurs during really just about 10 storm events um, annually. So a lot of that is happening right in these kind of short periods of time. And so we see a lot of kind of storm pulsed runoff driving, driving the issue. Um, and so just again, more of the kind of the current science before we get into the behavioral side of it, but on the physical side, this was a PNAS article that came out several years ago now, um, basically saying that what's going on there is a function both of agricultural trends and meteorological trends. And so I often present this when I give talks, especially to agricultural communities, as this being a climate adaptation problem. So it might be that what you're doing was good enough under different conditions, but it's perhaps not good enough anymore because we're getting these warmer wetter conditions, we're seeing the lake warmer in the summer, we're getting these bigger rain events um, and this kind of increased variability where you get the really big events. Um, and so it just may be, again, not that a lot of agricultural feels like the blame is being put on them for this issue unfairly. And so I think it's always good to point out that we know it's a function of both agricultural management practices and these trends that we're seeing as a result of climate change. Um, and so it is really, in my, in my opinion, really an adaptation issue more than anything else. Um, and there has been some dip debate over if the total phosphorus levels haven't changed, but we've seen this increase in dissolved reactive phosphorus. The question becomes, you know, what's really driving that? So there's been kind of some theories, and I don't know that the science has really settled on this, but as a result of pushing for kind of more limited tillage practices in the kind of starting in the 80s to reduce soil erosion loss in particulate phosphorus, one of the kind of unintended consequences, which gets into what I do in my work, was that um, when you're not tilling up the soil, then you end up applying the fertilizer to the surface of the field, which is very fast and very efficient, but then the fertilizer is just sitting there waiting to be washed away, right, during a big rain event. Um, and so it might have been one of those kind of well-intentioned policies gone awry, right, where 
Um, we fixed kind of one problem, but we created another problem. So a lot of what I do in my research is trying to um, not perfectly predict those sorts of things, but try to forecast a little bit into the future of what are some of those kind of behavioral consequences that might come up as a result of policies put in place. How can we better design policy so it's more effective, not just in the short term, but over time. So trying to kind of foresee a little bit of that and bring the behavioral piece more into the policymaking process. There's a big reliance in environmental policymaking on um, the physical science, right? Or kind of, can we better understand the system? Can we better model what's going on? And then let's propose things to fix it based on that without really thinking about the behavioral ramifications or the likelihood of that policy being successful um, in terms of the, the kind of changes that you need in the human system. So that's a lot of what I work on. Um, so again, just kind of background to getting to where I fit into this sort of research. Um, we, kinda, we know it's this climate adaptation issue. It's a combination of maybe kind of status quo management practices that aren't good enough in, under changing conditions. Um, and then there are, again, um, in this case, watershed modelers, also, go, also physical scientists working at the field level, trying to better understand what practices might be effective at reducing nutrient loss at a field level and then improving water quality at a landscape scale, right, or at a watershed level. Um, and so the field studies are um, probably a little more contradictory right now. Where there's a little more uncertainty and there's very different opinions at kind of a field level and what might be effective, what practices seem to be promising or not. Um, at the watershed modeling level, there's still a lot of work being done here, but one of the kind of first studies that came out just this year um, in Frontiers in Ecology and Environment, which had an OSU team, I think Jay's on here somewhere, Jay Martin and some of his students, um, they looked at a whole variety of different combinations of land management practices that could be put in place across the watershed, uh, looking at then to what extent could those practices get us to this current recommended reduction that's been put out there by um, US EPA, this recommended 40% reduction in total phosphorus. So this goal has been placed out there, the goal being to reduce total phosphorus into Western Lake Erie by 40% from 2008 levels. So if I remember right, 2008 was a very wet year. So the idea being that if we can reduce levels from a very wet year, then we're even better off in kind of the drier years. Um, and it's still a pretty big ask. And the focus there is much more on dissolved reactive phosphorus because that seems to be what's driving the trends right now. So the states and then Ontario, um, the province of Ontario are currently in a domestic action planning process to come up with how they plan to meet this 40% reduction. The goal is to get to that by I think 2025 seems really soon, but I feel like that's what it was. Um, and so people have started to kind of think about that and say, okay, well, what are the right sets of policies we could put in place? What sorts of management strategies should we promote through those policies? What's the likelihood of us getting to that 40% reduction? What's it gonna take? So again, kind of early in that process, this study came out, they looked at a variety of different scenarios. Um, some of their more, I don't know, has anyone ever seen research, this research presented by Jay or other? Um, I don't have a slide kind of with their results on there, but uh, they looked at a lot of different scenarios. They were informed through a kind of stakeholder advisory process, so that actually the ag um, sector and others had input into the sorts of things they'd like to see kind of tested out from the watershed model standpoint. And the only one, there was one scenario that got to the 40% reduction with some kind of degree of confidence, and it was a combination of these three practices here. It was getting filter strips on a much larger proportion of the landscape, that, again, is largely probably as a means of, of trapping particulate phosphorus and dealing, continuing to deal with soil erosion. And then subsurface application of fertilizer, which, again, gets away from that idea of kind of broadcast applying fertilizer where it just sits on the surface and is waiting for a, a rain event to wash it away. Finding some sort of, I guess, balance between completely going back to our heavy tillage practices of the kind of 60s and 70s but also finding a way to make sure that, you know, that fertilizer could get at least a couple inches beneath the surface of the soil. And then um, using winter cover crops. So going back to more of an ecological approach in agriculture to having some form of continuous living cover, right, as a way of um, cycling nutrients and kind of dealing with nutrient retention. Um, and so they looked at other things. They even looked at, which didn't go over well with some of the ag um, sector, but they looked at, you know, if we converted 50% of the agricultural land use into grassland, what would happen? And that even didn't get to the 40% reduction. So um, they didn't really look at that to imply that that was a thoughtful or, or possible policy scenario, but just to kind of have these benchmarks to look at the different combinations. Most of the things they looked at were much more land management focused and not so much on 
land use or converting ag land into other uses. Um, and so I have the numbers on another slide, but I think the recommended levels of adoption for those practices were something like 78% adoption of filter strips, which is very high and is really a um, kind of a, a cost benefit problem in the sense that no one's going to voluntarily or very few people will voluntarily take land out of production and grass a section of it to trap um, phosphorus. So that's going to be an issue of, you know, um, what's the public's willingness to pay for improved water quality and what does that translate into dollars that could be put into an incentive-based program? How many acres of filter strips could you buy with the money that's there? Um, so I haven't been focusing on that quite as much because that's kind of more in the economic realm of, you know, what does it take, um, how much you have to pay people to get this done. I've been focusing a lot more on these two practices simply because they're land management practices that have on-farm benefits or at least have the potential to have on-farm benefits. So they're not things that you'd be asking farmers to do um, that would only be for the collective good, right, from a kind of common sort of dilemma perspective. So they seem to have more promise from a behavioral standpoint if we want to think about ways of getting people to do this without necessarily paying them to do it, without necessarily regulating it, and that sort of a thing. Um, so that's where I've been focusing. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is kind of looking at farmer adoption of those two practices and thinking about um, the likelihood of, of getting to these kind of recommended target levels through voluntary approaches versus maybe more mandatory policy approaches and what that might look like. And again, the ultimate goal is really to take what do we know from a physical science perspective about what's effective and overlaying from a behavioral science perspective what's feasible because we don't often kind of put those two pieces together um, when we're thinking about environmental policy for a lot of different issues. Climate change being another great one where we, ne we never do that. Um, so this was just a graphic from our original NSF proposal that kind of started this work back in 2011. And so this was, a, again, a coupled systems proposal. And the, the big kind of research question that was driving this was, um, could we offset the predicted negative impacts of climate change on the lake through changes in human behavior? So kind of going back to that PNAS article, if this is a climate adaptation problem, we can't turn off the spring rains, we can't cool off the lake in the winter, and that's just going to happen in the short term. So the only lever that we have is on the behavioral side. So if we want to mitigate those potential impacts, that's the only way we can do it. And so again, it was a kind of a nice kind of case study area to test this idea out. But the idea being that you could apply this to bigger river basins, right? So you could think about this um, for the Mississippi River Basin. You could think about this for Chesapeake Bay or any sort of global context where eutrophication is a problem. Um, and so the design of the project was really we had kind of different objectives meant to tie together. My piece was on the farmer decision making angle. Pull that up. Um, and it was really kind of thinking about can we, one, can we increase adoption of the right practices once we discover what those right practices are, which is where the watershed modeling piece comes in, which I just covered up right here. Um, and then what policy lever would be most effective, which is kind of this piece up here. So we're looking at farmers as a really critical connection going from, okay, there's different policies we could put in place. We expect farmers to respond to those in different ways. That's gonna change the patterns of land management across the landscape. We can then model what those changes in nutrient movement would be based on those, the kind of probability of certain practices being put in place, given the characteristics of the field, the characteristics of the farmer, characteristics of the farm operation. Um, and then we can use those watershed models, right, to talk about differences in phosphorus loading to the lake. We can then use ecosystem service models to think about what sorts of kind of net benefits might come out of that to the lake in terms of water clarity or fisheries recruitment, that sort of thing. And then ultimately in a true coupled systems project, right, we, we would loop that back into the kind of policy process and say, okay, when we put these policies in place and we hopefully see some sort of net positive change on the tail end to things that people care about, how does that shift public attitudes? How does that shift public's kind of willingness to pay for further improvements? How does that translate into kind of new policy approaches? Um, and so we're still kind of working on connecting that even though the project ended in January. <laughs> so the challenge of doing some of these couple systems projects is kind of pulling all those pieces together is really hard. Um, and so then we also were looking at this under, given the kind of climate adaptation framing, looking at this under different climate scenarios. Um, so and it, a way to think about it would be, you know, Maybe we could get 100% of the farming population to use cover crops, but maybe that just doesn't matter because under even kind of best case climate, it's not gonna be effective, right? So trying to look at which of those mechanisms are gonna be most effective under a kind of range of potential climate futures.
So that was really the structure of the project. And so again, my piece was really collecting data and developing these statistical models of likely farmer adoption given sets of characteristics, and then trying to integrate that um, into really the, the spatially explicit um, watershed models about where those changes would occur and the impact that that would have downstream. Um, so what we did to collect data, we've actually done um, three survey projects now in um, some version of the Maumee River Basin or the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, this most recent one that we've, we conducted in winter of 2016, we're actually doing a panel study, so we're replicating it here upcoming in, in January, I guess. We'll be launching that. Um, was focused on the full Western Lake Erie Basin, so it was the full kind of area in green. The earlier studies focused just on the Maumee River Basin. Um, and what we did is we surveyed corn and soybean farmers. We only um, sampled from those over 50 acres because, interestingly, about 50% of the farmers from a population standpoint in Western Lake Erie um, own operations under 50 acres, so they only account for about 2 to 3% of the acreage in the watershed. So we just decided from a, um, from a behavioral standpoint, but also a policy standpoint, we don't really care about them <laughs> because their decisions are really not that important when it comes to what's going on at the lake. So we excluded all the really small farms, and then we further stratified our sample by farm size. So again, getting to this idea of thinking we want to not just understand farmers in the watershed, we want to understand um, the decisions of farmers operating the larger kind of proportion of land in the watershed. So we have essentially oversampled the big farms and undersampled the small farms so that we can better capture what's going on with decision making on these larger operations because they account for the majority of the landscape and ultimately have the biggest kind of net impact downstream on the lake. Um, and then our response rate for the survey was around 30%. It's been steadily dropping since our first survey that we did in um, 2011. We were closer to a 50% response rate. So we're dealing a little bit with, um, which 30 still isn't bad for a survey of this size, but um, we're dealing with a bit of survey fatigue. I think farmers are kind of tired of being asked about this and being the focus of attention. Um, so we're going to have to start thinking creatively, and I'm already kind of working on some collaborations on a new project with um, Purdue and Michigan State just so that we get better about kind of not reinventing the wheel and collaborating where we can and sharing data and um, just dealing with the challenge of, you know, people, it's hard to get people to respond to surveys. <laughs> and it's just getting harder and harder the more they get asked. Um, so what I'm going to do today is basically walk through these four questions and just provide some data that I think will start to answer these a little bit. These are kind of driven by um, really the kind of policy perspective of how can this data inform the sorts of solutions we might put together moving forward. Um, so the first is just very descriptive. What do farmers even think about this issue? Um, until we started doing the survey, we didn't really even have a good finger on the pulse of um, how farmers thought about it or what they were worried about and, and how motivated they were to even do something. Um, I'll then present some of our kind of modeling results about what factors seem to be driving adoption of certain practices. Again, focused mostly on cover crops and subsurface placement because those are the two, two of the more promising practices that, again, I think um, could be achieved through a variety of different policy mechanisms. Um, I'm then going to talk about what the likelihood of voluntary adoption would be. So given we know what might be driving adoption, is it possible to promote adoption of these practices through these really voluntary mechanisms or will it be, some have argued that regulation is the kind of only way to get there. And um, hint, I, I disagree with that. I, I don't think actually that mandatory uh, action is required. But um, And then to what extent can these factors be leveraged? So even if we know what's driving adoption, can we even do anything about that, right? And so we've done some initial kind of modeling to look at um, the probability of adoption increasing given certain increases in some of these factors that seem to be driving it from a, at least a correlational standpoint, because this is all cross-sectional data. But we're starting to do field experiments with quite a few different partners that are out there engaging farmers. And we're starting to do kind of pre-post-test evaluations of the forms of engagement. I'm challenging them to do things that I think are behaviorally more effective. So we can then start to measure maybe better ways of engaging farmers to see what sort of an impact we can have. So I've got some real preliminary ideas about this, but that's a big part of what, um, what I'm working on going forward. Um, so what do farmers think? We're like a step behind between these two. Um, so by far, the majority are concerned, thinking about this issue, wanting to do something about it. We certainly have a group of very motivated 
um, thoughtful farmers, I would say, when it comes to this issue. 77% think they have a good understanding of the four R's of nutrient stewardship, which has been a big campaign here in the last several years to be more precise in the way that nutrients are applied to the landscape. So to time it better, avoid, you know, when there's a chance of a like one inch rainfall event in the next 24 hours, um, to put it beneath the surface of the soil, to use the right rate based on soil tests that kind of tell you what your soils need. So there's been a big push to just kind of be more proactive about precision in the way we apply nutrients. Um, again, majority um, are well aware of these sorts of principles. They agree um, that they do think about nutrient stewardship both from a kind of profit standpoint, because certainly they'd like to spend less money on fertilizer, um, but also from a water quality standpoint. So they're not just kind of thinking about it from a farm profit standpoint, but they do have a sense of kind of um, social responsibility, I would say. 56% um, have actually changed practices on, the, on their farm in the last three years in this kind of category of 4R things that have been promoted, which has made the 4R people pretty happy. Um, and 54% are concerned about their farms contributing to harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie, which is, you know, over half. But when we look at some of the other things they're concerned about, those tend to be a little more motivating. So 77% um, are concerned about the negative impact of nutrient loss to farm profit. Um, and then this is the winner. 88% are concerned about additional governmental <laughs> rules and regulations. So um, one piece of advice I often give to people is you, ha you have a group of very motivated farmers who would like to do this under their own terms. So give them the tools to do that because they would be very happy to, because they don't want someone to come along and tell them how to do it. They'd like to kind of do it on their own. Um, but you'll see in some of the data I'll show in a minute that they're a bit skeptical of some of the solutions that are out there and haven't been probably fully convinced um, that the solutions being discussed are effective. Um, so how have these beliefs changed over time? So like I said, we've actually collected data not, not in the exact same kind of watershed, but um, similar sort of population over three points in time. So I kind of went through an exercise of looking back just to see what those trends kind of look like over time. And for the most part, we've seen a lot of increases in things that we would want to see increases in. So increased concern um, about nutrient loss, both on the farm and from a kind of collective um, water quality standpoint. Um, we've seen increases in the belief that nutrient loss will impact profit, will impact water quality. So all these numbers are going up over time. We assume or we hope that some of that's as a result of a lot of the education and outreach that's been put in place and even just the media coverage of the issue. Um, we've seen big increases in awareness of algae issues in Western Lake Erie. We've seen um, an increase in the percent of people who say they're at least slightly familiar with 4Rs um, and they've had at least some exposure to information about 4Rs. So we're seeing increases in all those things. What's more interesting is when we look at farmers kind of perceived control over the issue. Um, control over their farm's impact on water quality, control over, um, so again, at a collective level, water quality at a field level, nutrient loss. Those numbers have been basically static. They've decreased a little, probably not significantly. I didn't really look at that. Um, but we're not seeing changes in that. So we seem to see this trend where farmers are more concerned, more aware, more knowledgeable, more exposed, but pretty much not changing in their perceived control over the problem. That's a major issue from a behavioral standpoint because all of the motivational theories in behavioral science say that first you have to be concerned in some personal way about an issue, then you have to feel like there's a set of practical steps you can take to address it. And you hear this parallel a lot in climate change where we've kind of um, focused too much on these kind of fear appeals and trying to get people really worried and scared about the future. And all of the kind of newer data shows that when you use hope messages, you get over some of the um, political kind of ideological differences. You see people that are much more open to kind of addressing climate change because of taking more of a kind of positive spin versus a negative spin. Um, so we're seeing kind of some similar things here where I think we have a lot of aware, concerned, motivated people, but they um, perhaps have no hope about addressing the problem and they don't really see a way forward, which is the kind of killer to any sort of behavioral change, right? Because that's the last piece of the puzzle that has to be there for someone to actually change their behavior or take action in some new way. Um, so it's a bit problematic, and you'll see this kind of theme replicated in some of our um, regression models as well. Uh, so that's just kind of descriptively, what are some of the trends? What are we kind of seeing in terms of this particular audience? Um, the second question is, what is the likelihood then of voluntary adoption of these practices? 
So when we talk about different policy mechanisms um, in social science, we tend to kind of place them in three categories. So you have your kind of outreach focused voluntary adoption, right? Where you're out there educating, you're increasing awareness, and you're hoping that that changes people's kind of perceptions and beliefs about the behavior you're asking them to do, about the problem you're asking them to be concerned about. You hope that then translates right into kind of voluntary change. Um, the second category are the economic sorts of incentive-based programs, right? The assumption there is that you have certain things that you can't educate people into doing. You can't um, increase concern enough for them to do it because there's some sort of short-term cost that will just remain a barrier. So you have to provide some sort of incentive or disincentive, depending on what you're looking at, um, to promote that change in the short term. And then the third, obviously, is just regulatory action that, re that mandates a particular change. So we were interested in this project and kind of thinking across those three categories and trying to better understand which of those mechanisms may be more or less effective for particular practices that are being placed out there. Um, and with a big kind of interest in this question of voluntary adoption, because most of um, conservation in ag has relied on voluntary adoption because it's non-point source pollution, it's not regulated um, by the EPA, Probably not going to happen, although I just talked with some people at UC Davis who do similar work out there. And I guess um, Cal EPA is actually thinking about some sort of state level regulation of non-point source pollution. So someday it'll probably come along if California is thinking about doing it at a state level, but it's certainly not happening at a federal level. Um, and so we're very interested in this kind of question of voluntary adoption because that's probably the most likely path forward, at least in the Midwest for right now. And so we want to get a better sense of how likely that is to occur. Um, so when I'm talking about voluntary adoption, a lot of what I'm talking about is definitely on the outreach and education side, where again, you're targeting kind of the way people think about the issue, the way they feel about it, hoping that that translates into behavior change. But I am also talking about incentive-based programs because people still have to sign up for those, right? So um, there's a big bias in the kind of conservation world and agriculture where I call it the, it's like a preaching to the choir problem, right? Where you have this kind of same group of people who come and they participate in these conservation programs. Why? Because they're kind of concerned. They actually want to do something about it. You're not necessarily reaching maybe the audience that you need to reach with those programs. Um, so from a communication standpoint, when we talk about having an impact on people from a voluntary standpoint, our best case is that we have a nice, this is a poorly drawn normal distribution, but that we would have a nice normal distribution of attitudes among our population. And we would hope that most people are right here in the middle, right, where they have very neutral attitudes. They haven't developed an opinion toward whatever we're promoting. They maybe don't have an opinion about water quality in Lake Erie or climate change or cover crops, right? They just haven't really learned enough about it. And these are the only people that we expect to have an impact on through outreach efforts, right? Because these people are already kind of doing what we want them to do, and so we're not trying to shift them. These have very well-formed attitudes that are um, supported by a lot of very strongly held beliefs, and they're not going to change. And you hear this again with climate change, you hear the same argument, right? You're not trying to change deniers, you're trying to change the people that are here in the middle. Um, and so the question, part of the question, I think, with the issue of um, conservation in ag and water quality is what percent of our audience is kind of falling in this middle category? Are there enough of them there to even put a dent in the issue? right, if we try to engage in these voluntary approaches. Um, and so this is just kind of focusing again on two of these behaviors. Um, the reason you, have, you do have to look at a kind of behavior specific level, behavior by behavior, because often the motivations and constraints are different. And so you can't assume that someone who uses cover crops is the same type of person who will use subsurface placement. You can't assume, right, that the policy mechanisms that will be effective for one will be effective for the other. So we try to look at them on a really individual basis. Uh, and so this is just looking at our 2016 survey data. So as of 2015, that first column just shows how many farmers were reporting using this practice. And we had them um, report on a representative field. So we didn't ask them to report what are you doing across your entire farm operation, because that would be uh, too long of a survey. <laughs> so we said pick a representative field that's very typical of your farming operation, that's very similar right, to what you're doing across other fields um, and report on that. And so as of 2015, 27% of farmers in our survey, which means acres in the Western Lake Erie Basin, because again, we, we kind of stratified our sample based on acreage as opposed to just the farming population. So these numbers are actually, and we've looked at it both ways, are actually pretty representative of total acreage 
not just of individuals um, using those practices. So about 27% of the farmers in our survey, the acreage in the basin was in cover crops, about 25% in subsurface placement. They um, were asked then to report, okay, for next season, what are your intentions for this field? Uh, the numbers for cover crops dropped, so about 20% who said they plan to use cover crops the upcoming season. One kind of reason we think this might be is just because a lot of the incentive programs are poorly designed for cover crops because they might be like a three-year cost-sharing program. And you don't, there's no way you know if you're getting anything out of cover crops in three years because the benefits they provide are through soil health improvements and you don't get there in three years. It takes probably five years, maybe 10 years to get to some of those kind of quantifiable economic benefits. So we think what's happening, and some of this comes from some um, interview data I have with individual farmers about cover crops, is that they're getting to the end of that cost sharing program and profit margins are way too small and they just see no reason to justify the cost of the seed and the time and whatnot that it takes to do it. Because they're again not seeing um, an increase in yield or not seeing a decrease in other inputs, so they just don't see the, the cost benefit, the effectiveness. Um, subsurface placement, on the other hand, actually saw an increase of about 11%, where from one year to the next we had an additional 11% of kind of current non-adopters saying they intended to use it. Um, for those who did not intend to use it, we then asked them what's the likelihood of you using it in the future. And so this kind of motivated future adopter column are those individuals who said, well, I'm not going to use it next year, but I'm likely to use it in the future. So I would kind of argue that these are those people somewhat in the middle right, of the curve who are kind of sitting there like, well, I'm on the fence. I'm trying to decide how I feel about it. You know, you're welcome to convince me one way or the other. So we see that as a kind of key target audience moving forward. Um, and so when you add up these two columns, right, you get to this possible future column that says, like, here's the people who are already doing it, who are likely to do it in the future. And then we've looked at how those numbers might compare to what the watershed models are kind of calling for. And the good news, I guess, assuming that that one scenario that was effective in the watershed models, assuming it's accurate, um, we're actually able to meet the need for cover crops and exceed the need for subsurface placement just by focusing on those, what I would say is the motivated audience, right? Or the audience that we could actually have an impact on. So again, good news, we don't need everybody to do all these things and we might have enough motivated people to get there depending on the combination of practices. The one kind of caveat I would put out there is this is all assuming 78% adoption of filter strips, which I'm not an economist and I'm not studying that, but I think that's going to be a really hard sell. So they're actually the kind of team that's been working on these multi-modeling studies with the SWAT model are actually going back and running new scenarios and actually using some of our behavioral data to kind of come up with more feasible scenarios to see to what extent maybe an, you know matching, for instance, our subsurface placement um, level on the behavioral side, if that would get us far enough that we could reduce filter strip adoption, right, to find a more, again, behaviorally feasible set of solutions that might be out there. So that'll be a bit of a moving target going forward because I think at this point we're kind of going back and forth between the different teams and trying to figure out what's the, like, where do we meet in the middle and find a set, set of solutions that are physically effective but also behaviorally feasible. But the initial kind of take is that it, it looks like we, you know, there's some potential there. Whoop. Fell asleep on me. And so this is just kind of expanding beyond those two particular practices. We took uh, kind of reported use of a variety of management practices and then intended future use, averaged them across all the time points we had for the landscape, and then kind of looked at those potential futures, so kind of 2017, now almost 2018 and beyond, and we see the potential for movement, I guess, is the point of this slide, right? So for every one of these kind of practices that are being tossed around and that people are trying to assess the effectiveness of, we see the potential to increase adoption um, by, again, just focusing on those people that say, well, I'm not using it yet, but I'm likely to use it in the future. We see a lot more promise for things like rates based on soil tests, and so that would be kind of low-hanging fruit from a behavioral standpoint. Um, we see the smallest kind of increases for avoiding winter application and for drainage management. Those would be ones that would probably be a little more challenging to put into place. Um, so that's just to give you kind of a snapshot of kind of where we currently are on these practices and where we might be able to get, again, just focusing on those kind of folks in the middle that might be willing to do it um, without a lot of kind of pushing and prodding. <laughs>
Um, so the next question, what factors are really driving adoption of those practices? So if we've got a kind of audience in that population who we think we can have an impact on, what sort of levers can we pull to actually have that impact? Um, and so this is just the result of two um, multinomial logistic regression models, one for cover crops, one for subsurface placement. We categorize people into one of three groups. They're either called the innovators, which are the people already using the practice on their representative field, the future adopters, which are the ones that say I'm likely to use it in the future, and then the reference comparison group are the laggards, which are the ones who either say I will never do it or I'm unlikely to do it. So this is kind of, um, I guess I could say this is kind of worst case because we actually put the unlikely people into the laggard category, but there's still a chance, right, for some of them. Um, but we thought it was safer to just kind of lump all of them together and put them in the not going to do it category. Um, so what you're seeing here is there are certain things that don't seem to really explain the probability of you falling in one category or another. Age doesn't seem to matter. Income doesn't seem to matter. Um, we do see a positive impact of having more than a high school education among the kind of innovators for cover crops. So you're 2.2 times more likely to be an innovator than a laggard for cover crops when you go from having less than a high school education to more than a high school education. Um, we see a positive impact of farm size for cover crop innovation. This makes a lot of sense. We see a positive impact of the field being in a no-till strategy versus a conservation or conventional till strategy. Um, and that makes sense because cover crops are more effective in a no-till system. So those kind of go hand in hand. Um, we've made the argument in some contexts that no-till is like the gateway drug to cover crops, so you've got to first get them to do that, then cover crops might come along after that. Um, but what I want to point out is this right here. I think I can have a red box around it. The only predictor that we've looked at across all practices that has some sort of kind of significant impact on the likelihood of you being in one of these categories is um, going from low to high perceived efficacy. And we measured that along kind of three dimensions. So we measured um, your confidence, the confidence you had in your ability to implement that practice on the majority of your acres in the upcoming season. So if somebody said, gun to your head, you have to do this on 90% of your acres next year, how confident are you that you could do it? So this gets at what we call kind of self-efficacy in behavioral science, right? So um, do I feel like I have the ability to even engage right, in the set of solutions that are being recommended. Um, and then we measured what we call response efficacy along two dimensions. So we looked at what we would call kind of field level response efficacy. So if I put this practice in place, will it actually reduce nutrient loss on my field? And then we looked at this kind of collective efficacy. So if enough of us did this across the watershed, could we improve water quality in Lake Erie? So it gets a bit at the kind of the commons dilemma sort of problem, right? Of, well, it's nice if I do it, but if nobody else does it, then it doesn't make a big difference at the end of the day. So we measured all of those dimensions. So this is actually, and there was justification to kind of combine those as one overarching measure of efficacy, uh, meaning that they were highly correlated, basically. Um, and so what you see is that uh, you're about three and a half to four times more likely to be a future adopter versus a laggard for these two practices as you go from kind of low confidence and low belief in the effectiveness of the practice to high confidence, high belief in the effectiveness. And you're 10 to about 15 times more likely to be an innovator versus a laggard as you go from low confidence, low belief in the effectiveness to high confidence, high belief in the effectiveness. Um, which really parallels what we saw in just those kind of descriptive trends for control, right? Because if I don't think there's anything I can do about it, I'm probably not gonna do anything about it. Um, so we definitely see this positive effect, right, as they buy into this idea of, yeah, it's something I could do, and if I do it, it'll work. We see a positive effect on adoption, right? You kind of move up these categories from never to kind of already having it in place. Um, so then the question is, that's all well and good, but to what extent can we actually change efficacy? And if we do, is it going to have any sort of positive impact? This is, a, again, correlational data set. What does that actually tell us? Um, and so kind of going back to this idea of where do our people fall out, again, about 38% of our target audience falls into this kind of ideal middle category, right? Um, we don't have a normal distribution. We have a somewhat skewed distribution. Um, but we have at least 38% who haven't kind of committed one way or the other that are kind of sitting on the fence. Um, and so we expect, again, that those might be the ones we could have the biggest impact on. So we basically just 
um, looked at the predicted probability of adoption and how that changes as we increase levels of efficacy. So again, just using our cross-sectional data. And so if we go from kind of baseline measures of efficacy, so kind of where people currently are in their kind of confidence and belief that the practices work, we increase it by 10%, we increase it by 20, we increase it by 30. What happens to the probability of you being right in one of these three categories? And so what we see for cover crop adoption is that if we want to get to this kind of 58% goal for adoption that comes out of the watershed models, then we actually have to increase efficacy by about 90% because that's where we finally get to enough people falling into the innovator category to get to that target level. So that's a, probably a bit of a hard sell. My kind of assumed reason for this, and this is what we're starting to kind of look into now with the field experiments, is that cover crops relative to subsurface placement are a highly kind of risky and uncertain practice. And so it's probably not likely that we can just kind of convince them to do it, right? <laughs> because one, the physical science is a bit uncertain about when they work, under what conditions. There's actually data from um, Kevin King's work, who's with USDA, that says that they actually increase soluble phosphorus loss. They might be great for other things. They might be great for nitrogen, but they're not actually fixing kind of soluble phosphorus problems. So there's a lot of mixed messages out there about cover crops to begin with, on top of the fact that you have to use them for quite a long time before you see any benefits. And those benefits seem to be more on the reduced input side and not on the increased yield side in agriculture. And we just honestly don't have a good understanding of that from, again, cost-benefit standpoint. Um, so the assumption being that uh, if we can get voluntary adoption of cover crops, it's probably going to have to be through incentive-based programs because you're not going to get a lot of people just choosing to do it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, when you look at subsurface placement, we have a more kind of even distribution of people in these three categories. We have a lot more people already in the innovator phase. Um, and when we look at the predicted probability of adoption given these increases in efficacy, we only have to increase efficacy by about 45%. Um, to get to that 50% adoption level, again, placed out there by the watershed um, modeling studies. So probably a little bit easier to get there, and you see a much nicer kind of transition, right, between the categories as you increase efficacy relative to cover crops, which it's like you can't get there and at the last minute and everybody switches. Um, so a little more promise there, and again, this makes sense because unlike cover crops, subsurface placement is a very discrete choice with very certain outcomes. You just do it or you don't. And if you do it, it works. <laughs> um, so there's none of this kind of like, well, well, when will it work? And how will it work? And how much money will I save? It's none of that. Um, and we have a farmer in one of, our, the, one of the demonstration farms in Northwest Ohio who runs a 5,000 acre farm. So it's a big farm. So he's operating at a scale where he can actually purchase equipment and kind of see the return on that pretty quickly. Um, and so he purchased a strip tillage implement, which allows him to um, basically surface band his fertilizer and get it beneath the surface with, while barely disturbing the soil. Um, and it costs like $300,000 or something crazy like that because they're very expensive. Um, but he made that back in like three and a half years because he was saving $100,000 a year in fertilizer costs. So there, there are at least anecdotal examples of kind of what it takes to get your um, investment back on something like that. We don't have yet um, really good economic data that kind of translates that into smaller scale operations or helps farmers know for the increased cost it would be when I hire my applicator for the time it'll take. It takes twice as long to apply fertilizer beneath the surface as it does to apply it to the surface. So there's a lot of these kind of management challenges that have to be worked through. Um, so I don't think we're quite there with the really good kind of cost-benefit analysis of it, but I think it's possible for something like this, whereas it's not really for cover crops yet. Um, so I think with better kind of cost-benefit data, you actually would get voluntary adoption of this, just purely where farmers are kind of seeing the, the on-farm benefit and are going to switch, right? Because they'll see that, yeah, it's going to cost me X more an acre to apply, but I'm going to save more than that in my fertilizer costs, so it's a win right at the end of the day. So there's been, um, we've been kind of recommending that we do um, a better job on the kind of economics of this particular practice. And this just kind of shows you what that, that mean change in efficacy looks like on the scales that we use. So we have this kind of standardized scale of efficacy from zero to 10. This just kind of shows you where our farmers are starting out. So they're in the kind of six or less on the scale, zero to 10. Here's our laggards for cover crops and subsurface placement. Here's our future adopters. 
And this is about where our innovators are. They're kind of in this red band here. So those changes that I'm talking about, the 90% increase in efficacy and the 45% increase is basically going from here um, to here for future adopters. So it's getting them at least at or slightly above where the innovators currently are, which again makes sense because innovators tend to be really risk tolerant. They tend to be a little more conservation minded sometimes. So they're willing to take a little bit more of maybe a hit in the short term to do things they think are right. So it makes sense that the ones we're kind of focusing on now might be our more profit focused people who need maybe a little more, a little stronger efficacy beliefs to actually buy into doing these things. So again, most of the evidence is pretty consistent with what we, what we might expect. Um, so just quick recap, what do farmers think? Uh, concerned, aware, knowledgeable, but lacking a sense of control over the problem. Um, some of that having to do with weather and recognizing that they could do the best possible, make the best possible choices on their farm, but there are certain uncertainties that they just can't um, predict. Uh, one example is there was, um, just recently, you guys might have heard of this, I'm trying to remember what county it was, but there was um, an individual that applied manure and then a big rain event came through and washed all the manure into some local streams and killed like lots of fish. Like it was a big fish kill event. And so immediately everyone was kind of pointing to like, well, you're not following recommendations and you were out there applying before a big storm event, but if the forecast is wrong, the forecast is wrong, right? And there's nothing they can do about that. So most of those incidents, when they actually try to figure out what drove it, they find out that they actually were following best practices. They were actually doing what they should have done and the forecast was wrong, right? So there's a level at which I can't argue with the farmers who say they don't have control because there are just things that they, they really don't have control over, even if their intentions are really good. Um, so what's the likelihood of voluntary adoption? I would say pretty high. Um, Don Scavia, who's one of the watershed modelers up at U of M, um, wrote a, a, a piece for The Conversation. I don't know if you guys ever read The Conversation. It's like a popular science outlet. You can pitch ideas to this kind of online outlet. And then if they like it, you get to write up a little like 1,000 word summary of your research. It's kind of great. Um, and so he wrote this kind of piece basically saying voluntary adoption has never worked in agriculture. The only way we're going to get where we need to get with Lake Erie is to regulate it, to mandate it. I a little bit disagree. I think some of the fault falls back on um, conservation organizations, scientists, the government that we haven't always given the best recommendations and um, we haven't always given farmers maybe the right tools to kind of confidently engage in the sorts of practices we're asking them to. Um, so I would say that, I, that the, the potential for voluntary adoption is there. Um, 30 to 40% of farmers are motivated to change, and that's about half of current non-adopters. So when we look at those kind of trends across the watershed, at least half of the people not doing these things yet are willing to do it. And that's pretty good. And so again, I feel like the onus is kind of more on the scientific and the um, regulatory and the conservation community to figure out how to, to give them the right tools for that. Uh, what factors are driving adoption? on a Case by case standpoint, practice by practice, it varies. But the one thing that seems consistent is this idea of efficacy. So confidence in one's ability to take action, a belief that practices are effective. And then to what extent can these factors be leveraged? The classic kind of scientist answer is it depends. Um, but I think for practices that are lower in risk and uncertainty, where we can actually do really cost benefit analyses, um, I think we can actually build efficacy around those and promote that voluntary adoption without cost sharing and without having to go into the kind of regulatory arm. Um, so next steps, just to kind of wrap up, I'm working on an analysis and a paper with one of the um, former engineering postdocs kind of asking, does it matter where the motivated adopters are located? So if it happens that those half of non-adopters are in like low risk areas in the watershed, then maybe it just doesn't fix any problems. Um, so we're kind of overlaying the behavioral data with the um, kind of nutrient loss, estimated delivery of DRP across the watershed and, and running these kind of scenarios that we call, um, you know, targeting uh, adoption to physical hotspots, which would be like the high risk areas in the watershed from a physical standpoint, targeting adoption to what we would call the social hotspots. So where we have a lot of people, so actually the lighter colors on here, a lot of people that are already using these practices. So you'd have this normative sort of component that you could leverage where it's like, this is what we all do. And so it's easier to sell it. You know, if we targeted things differently and we placed those adopters in different places, what's the net impact then downstream on the lake? And then even pairing them up, right? So best case, 
if you pair up what's high risk from a physical standpoint with what's high risk from a behavioral standpoint where like nobody's doing it, you might get the biggest bang for your buck. So starting to think about targeting, not just from a physical standpoint, which is how targeting is usually thought about, but by also thinking about it from a behavioral standpoint. So we're working on that. Um, I mentioned that we have these you know, ideas from a correlational standpoint about the impact of efficacy, but I'm working with um, the Blanchard Valley Demonstration Farms and with a couple of conservation districts to start measuring their kind of outreach programs. And then in particular, Seneca County Conservation District has a very forward thinking woman leading that. And um, she's really excited about doing new things. So I'm working with her to kind of mock up strategies that we know from behavioral science tend to be effective, and then starting to kind of randomly assign people to groups when they come to these events, have half of them do that, have half not, right, and start to try to assess the effect of that. So some of the things we're talking about, um, we know that when it comes to dealing with uncertainty, so like something like with cover crops, that group deliberation is really helpful. One of the critiques we hear a lot from farmers for cover crops is that they go to an event, they get a show and tell, they see someone using the practice, they hear why it's so great, and then they go home thinking like, that's nice, but it's not gonna work for me. So we never really give them opportunities to kind of sit there together and troubleshoot, right? And to kind of think about, well, why does it work for you? How is my situation different? How could I make it work for me? What sort of concerns that I have? We just don't build that into these events. Um, so that's one strategy we're talking about doing. Another is goal setting. So there's a whole literature on goal setting, which is like you're much more likely to follow through on your good intentions when you have a concrete plan of how to get there. Um, and that's not just a, like a plan in your head or a spoken plan, it's a written plan. Um, so the Seneca County District is working on this kind of goal setting exercise for cover crops where again we'll kind of test to what extent that actually helps people follow through on good intentions. Um, other ideas that are a little more out there and are going to be harder to set up in this context are kind of using narrative persuasion, emotionally engaging farmers, getting, um, you know, they often have these uh, innovators who kind of have people come to their farm and see what they're doing, but they're not always the most engaging people. Um, so <laughs> it's thinking about like those spokespeople and who are the right spokespeople to get up there and kind of engage people and get you excited about it, right? Um, so that's a little more out there, but again, I have one person at one conservation district <laughs> that's excited about that. Um, and then the last thing is we have this new NSF project. So um, kind of thinking more broadly, if we start to better understand the likelihood of these changes happening across the landscape, what impact does that have ultimately from a regional standpoint on sustainability and resilience? Um, so this is our overly complicated uh, framework for this new project. But at the core, at the field level, we're still gonna be trying to assess the probability of farmers making changes in their land use and land management in response to different policy mechanisms in response to different changes in climate, um, in response to different public pressure. So kind of thinking about a variety of sort of external pressures on the individual farmer. And then using that knowledge to incorporate more um, behavioral heterogeneity into how we represent uh, behavior in these big kind of economic regional models. So they tend to have, the big regional models tend to have um, really simplified representations of human behavior. Um, and so we're gonna try to um, be more explicit about kind of diversity and how those decisions are made and integrate that into some of these models that are used to, to think about sustainability and resilience at a much larger scale. So that is kind of where I'm heading with all of this. Um, again, we've got descriptive um, reports that have a lot of this data there if it's something you're interested in. We've got five or six papers published on this and a lot of other things in the works. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to answer questions. We're probably out of time. I don't even know what your timeline is, but. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Great.